just so you all are aware, we are going to record this. And so um, just note that you are being recorded and these recordings will go up on YouTube for later viewing. And this presentation will also be repeated on Thursday night, this Thursday night at 6.30 if um, a friend or acquaintance or volunteer cannot attend. Okay, well, welcome. Um, we are talking about raised bed gardening today. I am your presenter, Nancy. Hopefully everybody could hear me okay. If not, please just type in the chat box and we will help you with that. So we're really talking about utilizing containers and raised beds today. I'm coming to you from Cook County, Illinois in Madsen. Uh, just south of, uh, of Chicagoland, and it stopped raining, so um, that's a good thing. All right, when you think about um, uh, raised beds, you should always think about location, uh, just as in any uh, vegetable gardening bed. Sunlight is key, good soil. Again, if you have good soil, you should be um, considering a raised bed because that's a way to introduce your own uh, soil blend. Um, and just a, uh, another reminder, please be sure to mic your, um, put your microphones on mute. And um, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. But I will take questions at the end and go through the chat box to, um, to uh, refer to some of your questions. And maybe I will cover those along the way as well. Okay, so back to where to begin. Um, Good soil, again, you'll be introducing your own soil, so that's a good thing. You don't have to worry about drainage when you're utilizing a raised bed. Uh, water supply, I always ha consider having that close. I know a few community gardens out there, um, their only option is to use uh, rain barrel water. Now, um, we don't recommend using uh, rain barrels for watering edibles, but there are precautions you could take to minimize the risk of um, any uh, foodborne illnesses that may contaminate water that are on your roof, you know, as far as uh, bird droppings go and things like that. So we could talk later about that. Um, with the raised bed, it should be easily accessible. Um, so perhaps out of your, um, outside your kitchen door or close to that so you could easily um, harvest and, and bring these to your home to, to eat. Uh, you want to allow sufficient space. So, you know, we're going to talk about the depth of your raised bed, but if you're looking at just leafy greens, you know, you could get away with six inches of soil. If you're looking at something like tomatoes, peppers, deeper growing uh, crops, you're looking at at least 18 inches and we'll get into that. And of course, as you're um, constructing these, they should be on level ground preferably, but, you know, just try to do the best you can. Um, if the ground is not level to, to level it by hand and not be bringing any, he any heavy machinery in to, to accomplish the job. So when we talk about how much light we're looking at, um, six hours per day, most vegetables will require full sun. Because you could get away with um, some dappled sunlight for lettuce, um, but that, that's about it. So look for at least a, a six hours of sun. You know, you could just monitor your yard on a daily, basis and see where that's at, but um, you're going to get the most sun on your south or west facing side of your your home and, you know, as long as there's no shade trees. With herbs, if you're looking to grow herbs, there are some shade tolerant uh, herbs as far as uh, parsley, lemon balm, mint, angelica, chives, sweet woodruff. The sweet woodruff, there's an, an underutilized herb that's pictured there on the right hand side. Um, but also with these herbs, they are quite aggressive. So with lemon balm and mint, uh, I would definitely be planting those in, in a container separately because they could really take over your garden. Uh, chives could be a bit of a nuisance, but what you could do is as the flowers are spent, you just remove those and, and that will keep the seeds from spreading. So when you think about how much space do you need, well, here in the lower... Uh, left hand corner you could see a, a patch of pumpkins they need quite a bit of of uh, space so they would almost need their own raised bed if you were going to utilize some big lining crops like pumpkins watermelon uh, cucumbers on the other hand could be grown vertically and we'll get into that corn would almost need it, their own raised bed as well you could see how tall leg leggies these get and you do not want them 
shading out other crops. So I would suggest having them in their, their own raised bed or um, just not, you know, not utilizing these types of plants in a raised bed situation. So when you think about how much soil you will need, well, it's uh, just a simple equation, uh, length times width times height. If that's in, if your units in feet, that will give you your cubic feet. So we're just trying to figure out the volume there, and hopefully this image to the right, five by five by five feet, is is giving you um, an idea of how to measure. Uh, now, if you have larger raised beds or multiple raised beds, and you want to figure out your cubic yards, you would just divide that number by 27, and that will give you your cubic yards. Which, if you're buying compost or soil in bulk, that's how you're going to find it sold. Uh, by the cubic yards. If you're buying it in bags, you'll see it as cubic feet. Um, so I'm just some examples. So if you have two beds at uh, four by eight feet by one foot tall, that's going to be 32 cubic feet. And if you're having two of those, you just simply add 32 and 32. So that'll give you 64 cubic feet um, to get to um, cubic yards. You just divide that by 27. So you're looking at about two, 2.3 uh, cubic yards, and you're really better, you don't want to cut it short by getting two yards. So I typically round, round up to uh, to the three cubic yards and, and use the leftover as, uh, you know, maybe just top dressing if it's compost, adding that to other parts of my garden. Um, another, a similar uh, equation down there, again, just note that if you're, if you're uh, not working in feet for your depth, you know, you're looking at six inches, you'll just have to convert that to, you know, 0.5 feet. So if your bed is four feet by eight feet by six inches, another way to put that to, to have the um, units all, um, all the same is four by eight by 0.5 feet. Okay, and again, you know, you're looking at 16 cubic feet, uh, two beds, that's 32 cubic feet, divide that by 27, and you're looking at right around one cubic yards. And honestly, it would be pushing it, you know, your bed would be lower uh, than necessary with soil if you're, you're only getting a cubic yard. So perhaps in this situation, you could buy a yard in bulk and then, and then add some, some other amendments to compensate. There's also um, plenty of landscape calculators out there. So if you just search, uh, search, put in a search engine landscape calculator, uh, that can give you some volume estimates if you just type in your square footage um, in depth of your beds. As far as soil choices, I really, um, you'll hear, you'll read mixed things about this. I'll, I'll start out with uh, soil choices for raised beds. Definitely use something high in organic matter. Um, I often see gardeners using straight compost. Uh, that's what I use. You'll see that um, this is where you get, um, you know, some mixed results as far as how much percentage could I use of topsoil? I really think that depends on the quality. Uh, typically, um, you know, I'm going about 20% topsoil, the rest with compost, but you could go up to maybe 50% if you have a good quality topsoil. Um, just keep in mind that garden soils can hold up, you know, hold too much water. Um, you know, there's still sand, silt, and clay, probably heavier on the clay side, depending where you live, could be sandier towards, uh, towards the lake, but, um, Keep that in mind and uh, just you could get an analysis of from where you're purchasing it and always blend it in well. Uh, you know, this is your chance to to start with good fresh soil. So always um, put good inputs in and keep that in mind and believe, you know, believe it that you could just grow in straight compost. As far as containers go, you're going to want to work with a soilless mix. Uh, so this is a peat based product. A lot of people also in that picture there in that can. Thank you, Stop. And um, if uh, if you're shopping around, you could buy the uh, peat and compressed bales. They also come in a ready-made soilless potting mix bags. I typically will go with uh, ones that do not have fertilizer added uh, because you'll get more bang for your buck just by buying the um, ready-to-go soilless mix and adding your own. Um, your own fertilizer types to there. Typically, these peat-based products will be mixed with the perlite. As you see, those seed sprouts um, shown at the top of the slide 
those white specks are perlite. So the benefits of the, using this soilless mix, they drain well, less disease, less insects. And you could reuse that from year to year as long as you don't have any major disease outbreaks or insect problems um, go, and it's still looking good, go ahead and reuse that and maybe top dress with some compost from year to year. But as I'm harvesting and um, cleaning up my garden, I always shake out root balls to, you know, I don't want to waste any of that good soil I added. So shake those back out into your raised bed um, and then you could compost um, any non-disease plants that, that you're um, cleaning up. With this soilless mix, you always want to keep in mind to, uh, to pre-mix it before you're adding it to your bin or just add it um, and, and pre-mix it right within the bin. But it's not like you want to add this dry plant something and then try to water it because it does repel water. So you really want to get in there and mix it with your hands or a shovel or a trowel in order for it to adhere to the, the water to adhere to the soilless mixed particles. So when you're looking for uh, container vegetable gardening, we'll start there. Always use a suitable size container with drainage holes. It, it still boggles my mind that we have um, these, these decorative pots sold without holes in the bottom. So make sure to investigate, you know, it's not good practice to just line the bottoms with rock. There is still nowhere for the water to go. It may help temporarily, but uh, ultimately as you water that, water will build up and, and could lead to rot in your plants. We talked about the soil mix, so just use proper soil mix. You don't want to use, I really don't use any topsoil in uh, something like containers, so I'm using maybe compost and um, the soilless mix is my mixture in, in container vegetable gardening or any container uh, gardening for that matter. Think about variety selection, so you could choose dwarf varieties or your patio type tomatoes for larger pots. Um, and that way, you know, if you just don't have space for, for gar a garden or even a raised bed, then just utilize bigger containers to, to get the crops you want growing. Proper fertility. So again, if you're using a sterile so, uh, soilless mix, sterilized soilless mix, you're going to need to add fertility to that um, in order for uh, plants to grow vigorously. Always proper watering. Uh, this may be repetitive if we have some master gardeners on there, but watering deeply, uh, more deeply, less frequently, almost to where the water is coming out of the bottom. Uh, and, and, and that will depend again on, on rainfall, not much rainfall, we'll get into uh, smaller container gardens. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And also uh, when, when the level of maturity of these plants. So if you're yielding fruit um, you know, on a tomato plant, then you'll be watering it more, same with cucumbers. So think about um, critical watering periods of these vegetables and, and keep them vigorous when they're producing. And that might be watering more than once a day. So when I talk about potting soil mix recipes, this was a recipe that was taught to me by uh, Rick Bayless's gardener, the, the famous chef here in, in Chicago, um, Bill Shores used to teach a composting class for us. And this is his recipe that I found to be very useful. I even use this for uh, my seed starting mixes. But you could find um, a, a variety of uh, seed potting mix recipe, recipes. I know Cornell has a good uh, recipe for uh, large scale um, mixtures. But you could, again, you could always uh, type in uh, compost mix calculator to, to determine compost ratios. And that will tell you, you know, how much greens to browns, you know, and how carbon rich some of these products are. Because if you're adding something like uh, sawdust to your compost, that's very compost, that's very carbon rich. So you want to be careful with that. But basically this recipe is five parts peat or core and what core is, is just uh, ground up coconut husk. It's, it's a bit more sustainable than peat because the issue with peat is that it grows at a very slow rate. So we're harvesting it at a, uh, it at a much faster rate. It grows in wet areas. Uh, so now we're utilizing uh, core, which is um, compressed. You usually see it, I'll, I'll have some images coming up of that, but you'll usually see it as a compressed brick and it will swell. And that's it um, after I, wet it down in the bottom left-hand picture, that's a picture of core. 
So just an alternative product out there that would be the organic part, then four parts sifted compost. So that's what we have a master gardener doing here. Uh, Linda Anderson, if you're out in the crowd, I, I utilized your photo here. Um, but she's just running her um, finished compost over uh, a hardwire cloth frame that we built and all the finished compost is falling through and what remains on top is the unfinished, uh, not you know partially decomposed uh, parts of the compost and we will add that back into our compost bin. And then you have a nice clean material to work with as far as the compost goes. Lastly would be your one part perlite or vermiculite and that would be your mineral part. Uh, perlite really helps with uh, drainage and vermiculite does both. It could help with drainage, but it also has water retention properties. So you could uh, utilize both of those if you wish. Here's some other container options, just getting crafty. So something like this large, you know, three by three by three foot container could probably, would definitely support something like a tomato plant. Um, here's some uh, just some hanging baskets where they're growing uh, those tomatoes upside down, kind of homemade, uh, those topsy turvies if you've seen those. And then something creative where they reuse the uh, grill and are, are just growing um, using that as a container. Also tires, tires are very commonly used for vegetable crops. Botanic gardens are using them. I don't see any problems as long as there's no major um, uh, contaminants visible on the tires and, and here they're growing potatoes and in this system they will uh, stack up tires as the potatoes grow to give more room uh, stack them up add more soil to give more room for the potatoes to grow underground so I thought that was interesting again just more container options it doesn't have to be anything pretty you know we're looking at growing vegetable gardens it doesn't necessarily have to be ornamental so you could use um, a variety of things. Here's just lined milk crates with plastic. You know, this is again more ornamentals in here, but certainly could be utilized for for growing some vegetables. And those are food grade quality because they're shipping food in there. Again, just you, if you're ever worried about um, what was held in these containers you're using, or even wooden pallets, then you could uh, sanitize them with the light bleach solution and allow them to dry out before you plant in them. Um, and that usually uh, will help. You will see these self-contained growing units out on the market. There's a variety of them. Uh, we often use these uh, earth boxes in, in the Chicagoland area because we had a partnership with them, but there's a variety of brands out there. Uh, here you could see we've even grown something like 12 to 16 stalks of corn in one. Uh, that's the that's the faded out picture. That was the only good picture I have of growing corn in this earth box. But I did want to I would did want to show that. But we we actually did harvest some some corn ears of corn from there, and they did okay. They do get a bit top heavy and and require a lot of water. So when I would leave them for the weekend at my workplace, they would be toppled over, bone dry, but perked back up. So not the not the optimal. Uh, choice for growing corn, but but it's doable. And then we have a mix of herbs there pictured with two master gardeners. And some of these containers even come with uh, accessories like this, um, this trellising system using string. Now what's unique about these is that they have a built-in reservoir. So you could see the tube placed on the lower right-hand corner um, that you water through this tube. It goes down into a reservoir. It's really like a grate that separates the soil from the water and it will hold roughly three gallons and be watering um, from the bottom up. So it's it's neat in that realm where you're not you're not worried about too much evaporation because it's going into this closed system sitting at the bottom and the water could be absorbed up through the roots. So keeping water off the leaves is helpful for uh, preventing disease and insect spreading. And then this plastic cover that sits on top acts as a mulch, warms the soil, speeds things up, but certainly will not allow rainwater in. Again, so you're constantly watering these even if we have rainfall. Here's just some full grown uh, earth boxes. This was planted at my, my house. So we just, you know, we utilized um, trellises going down for the cucumbers. You could fit four cucumber plants in one of these or 
six pepper plants or two tomatoes. Now on to raised bed gardening. Some benefits is the soil is going to stay loose, uh, warmer, higher yield. So you're packing things uh, more intensely. You're planting them more intensely, shading out weeds. And, um, you know, you're not worried about walking in there and leaving rooms for uh, space for rows. So you could really pack, uh, pack and plant these quite, uh, quite intensely. And um, so that's a great benefit. Of course, the higher you build it, the easier it's going to be on, on your back. If you have contaminated soil with lead or other heavy metals, well then utilizing the raised bed is gonna help prevent that from um, getting absorbed by your plants. You could always just uh, cap off the ground underneath with either a heavy plastic or rubber geotextile fabric. So any, any one of those could work. Uh, better air movement and drainage, which will equal to uh, fewer pests. Uh, ideal height is really uh, 12 to 24 inches. 24 inches is a nice uh, seat height. So if you want to sit there and work, you could. Or um, again, if you're growing shallow rooted plants, you could uh, grow sufficiently in six inches. If you are working with uh, people in wheelchairs, you, you're looking at uh, something like the lower, uh, the two lower images where the, the raised beds are on legs really helps. Now, I know they have some crossbars on the, the, the lowest picture, uh, that picture there by Candace Miller. That might not be great for a wheelchair, you know, if, if it gets in the way of their feet. So keep that in mind. But otherwise, they have these prefabricated beds. I think the, the picture in the middle, those beds are three by four feet wide, uh, about one foot deep. Those are prefabricated kits. I think you'll, you'll spend about $200 each on those. They're made of cedar. Um, so you could easily build your own or, you know, go with, you know, if you're not construction savvy, then go ahead and uh, you could invest in one of these. They've, they've done well for us. Ideally, you're looking at a four inch, I'm sorry, a four foot wide uh, width because, you know, by any length. And that's as long as you could access it by all four uh, or all, the, both of the longer sides because your arms reach reaches about two feet on either side. So if it's against, against the building, you're looking at um, shortening the, the width. And if you're working with school groups or, or kids, I found that four feet is even a bit wide. So if you could do three foot for youth gardens, that, that is helpful, or just have the adults um, harvest from the center, plant in the center. And, you know, if you could go with three foot wide, that's okay. It's just you're looking at you know, maybe a 12 foot length uh, piece of wood. So you could, um, you know, I just try not to waste any wood. So if you could cut, you know, equal parts, cut four pieces, you know, at three foot long from a 12, 12 foot long piece of wood, then it's, um, you're not having any waste. <clears throat> if you get boards longer than 12, 12 feet, you know, if you're looking at 16 or more, you will notice some warping. So just keep that in mind. I'm always at these um, lumber yards choosing, you know, the best possible lumber I can. Sometimes it, it takes a while to find um, the least work pieces, but it, it's worth it. Um, if you're, again, uh, as a reminder, if your bed is located against a wall, a building, a fence, and only accessible from one side, you know, you're going to look at two and a half feet wide max. And this picture at the top, I uh, just want to point out that, you know, this is extra wide. So to harvest, they, they literally have to climb into this bed to, to harvest, which is going to lead to soil compaction. So always consider that. I, I may have made this bed a bit uh, more narrow, just so you could easily um, harvest from any side. Just some material choices. I know that we had a question come in earlier on the chat box about using treated lumber. So according to the EPA, um, they had uh, the arsenic treated lumber, uh, which was, you know, the CCA treated lumber that has been phased out since 2004. So unless you're getting an old stock of wood, you know, this should be well phased out. And the wood now is, is uh, treated with copper. So you shouldn't um, have any worries about that. Uh, if you are worried about that, Excuse me. Um, 
if you are worried about uh, using treated number, it can't you can be it can be lined with a heavy plastic. Just be sure to put holes on the bottom so there are there is drainage. And um, if you have uh, if you want more information on this, I'm happy to share some the EPA studies they shared. Honestly, if um, you know if copper was if copper can leach out of these, but if it was if it did leach you would almost see signs of detriment in the plants before you were consuming them. If, if the copper levels ever got well out of range, then you the, the plants would actually begin dying off before you consume them, that's for sure. So you could certainly email me if you still have concerns. Heavy, you know, lining it with the heavy plastic. Um, this is my computer. Otherwise, you're looking at... I didn't know you left your computer open. If you wouldn't mind, just uh, please mute your, uh, make sure your microphone's on mute. Mute. Um, so, with cedar, uh, you know, you look if you're looking at untreated options, it would be cedar and pine more locally. There's a number of other types of wood. Cedar is naturally rot resistant, but about two times more the price. So you want, you know, just it depends. If, if you have the money, I would say invest in cedar if you're if you're still worried about using treated lumber. And if not, then, you know, treated lumber um, is one way to go. I line it with plastic and, you know, that, that'll give you 30 years, you know, versus cedar might be on the 10 to, to 15 year side, depending how, how well you treat it. Uh, you could always look for numbers on this tag. So if you look in the lower left hand corner, just look at um, what this you, uh, what's this label, you know, I usually write down these codes and go look them up to, to see what exactly was treated with. Um, concrete could be an option. There's these prefabricated beds um, that are that come in kits, uh, retaining walls, uh, that, that picture in the top middle, those look like almost uh, recycled plastic lumber. Those are fine, difficult to tuck, cut. You know, if you're looking at a six by six inch piece of wood, recycled lumber, you're going to need a special saw to cut that or you're going to be cutting you know you're going to make be making three to four cuts to to cut that piece in half completely um or using a jigsaw you know like a, a reciprocating saw and what you know that doesn't leave the cleanest cut so just keep in mind the the tools and construction equipment you have at your on hand to utilize here you could see in the top uh right hand picture utilizing a, a wooden pallet Again, just, you know, disinfect that or, or clean it with a light bleach solution, like a 10% bleach solution, let it dry out completely. Um, and then these um, these trough style gardens on the bottom right are becoming more popular up here. I think these go for about uh, $89 to $150, depending on the size. But that's that's a nice instant raised bed to good, good depth. So another um, option you could consider. You could also just uh, simply be growing in um, something like compost heaps on the top top left corner. So you don't need to retain the soil. Sure, it will be eroding a bit, but if you don't have the material to retain the soil, then you could simply build up um, a, a mound, flatten it out on the top and, and plant directly in there. You could get creative with these type of, uh, this is again a plastic type resin, the curved, curved retaining, uh, curved raised bed on the top right hand corner. Um, just some things that they're building in the Chicago area, the kitchen community built these style beds for for um, school gardens. Also, you could think about doing in layers. So the middle picture there, you know, different types of heights, getting more decorative, attractive uh, style raised beds. And uh, another, just a clearer picture of the beds with legs on there. So you could see that's easily accessible uh, with the wheelchair, good good height, good amount of soil. Lastly, on the bottom right, just smaller raised beds. Um, so again, more utilizing these for growing greens, different greens and, and shallow, shallow rooted plants. Here's some uh, more images of uh, beds built with stone, cinder block. If you are stacking cinder block higher than uh, one high, you will want to reinforce it with some rebar or some type of uh, heavy duty stake. You want to check with your municipality. There may be some building codes involved with um, stacking 
retaining, uh, restacking these cinder blocks uh, to reinforce them every so often. And if you're working here, you could see uh, uh, with the cinder block bed picture to the right, that's the same cinder block bed and the, or no, I'm sorry, the bottom two are the same. She's really working with her slope here. So she has two high on one side and almost went down to uh, still too high on the other side, but the, the, the first layer is almost buried to that. So always work with your, your slope and your topography um, if you're not able to level the ground underneath first. Uh, these beds, you know, that was a, a nice decorative bed on the left with uh, some nice retaining wall blocks, quite expensive when um, that, those fees, the cost of those stones will add up. You could even do something like this was popular a few years ago, these spiral gardens. A lot of people are planting these spiral gardens and with herbs. So just another way to get more creative. The lower bed with uh, used with flagstone, just much too wide. This is a garden I work in and it's, it's a pain uh, climbing up. You know, it's too wide. So I do have to climb in there from time to time to harvest and and plant and just stepping on these stones that are not mortared or are a pain. They always fall. So make sure again you keep keep in mind the, the correct width of these raised beds and the materials you're using. This might work well for an ornamental bed where I'm not trying to get there, get in there on a weekly basis, but with my vegetable gardening, uh, this this style did not work too well. Also on the market now are these big bag beds or fabric beds. So this again is an instant raised bed. Uh, here they are utilizing drip irrigation. That's always nice in a raised bed. And as long as you have good water pressure, it, it shouldn't be a problem with um, utilizing drip irrigation in raised beds. And what they do is just bury the line in between there. So we're not having a trip hazard. So it's just buried uh, lightly you know, a few inches underground as the drip lines go from one bed to the other so people can mow, weed whack, not trip. And these are about 22 inches deep. They'll vary in size, um, but it's nice. They're, they actually air root prune. They, they were designed to grow nursery stock plants. So I've seen even much smaller bags with a, almost, um, you know, a, a couple inch diameter tree and um, growing growing nicely in there without girdling roots, but now they're marketing them more and more for, for raised by gardening. And this is just another image of, of some prefabricated raised beds you could get these. Sometimes you could stack these. They're typically made out of like a recycled lumber product. And those run for maybe for a four by four bed, these, those might run 30 to $40. When you are putting soil into there, I would recommend using buckets or not uh, resting a wheelbarrow against them because these, these corner brackets are not really reinforced. They're just kind of uh, cut out sections where they, they just niche into there and, and they're not the most durable. So be careful when you're uh, resting things on them because they can break or you could certainly reinforce them with some galvanized screws. If you're looking to begin a new bed, you know, you do want to kill off the vegetation that's existing on, on the ground. So a couple ways you could do that is simply with this lasagna gardening or sheet composting. That's what they're doing here on the right is they lay a layer of cardboard, typically wet it, a layer of straw, compost, and food waste and, and cap it off with, um, with some compost or soil. Again, check your ordinance, your local ordinances with your municipality for compost regulations and doing this. This was done in, in Cleveland with no problem, but I know in Chicago, they don't want any open containers of compost. So this wouldn't fly in the city by me. Um, and if you didn't, you know, and that's again, just to, to build this uh, lasagna gardening and plant right in there after a month of decomposition, whereas a lot of times when I'm building school and community gardens, I ask them start saving your cardboard. And what we do is just line line the vegetation with that, even existing grass, make sure there's no seams uh, showing. You don't want to see any green. You overlap the seams, wet it, and then we just put mulch on top and we'll build, we'll build the raised beds right on top of that. And again, that was, this is a finished product on the right hand side. That's this garden pictured here where we put the, the cardboard down on the on the bottom picture. 
and that's held up well. We installed that last year. I went there um, this year. A couple, you know, a couple spots of grass crept through, but hardly any. And, you know, over time, this will decompose. And then when you're replacing mulch, you could always come in there with a heavier duty landscape fabric um, as more of a permanent barrier. But I only recommend that heavy duty um, landscape fabric when, you know, I'm not going to utilize the soil that will suffocate the soil um, and have, you know, long term effects on the soil underneath and compact it and suffocate it. So as long as you're going to always utilize this as a raised by garden, that's fine. But if you're planning to plant in the ground later on, you want to be careful with that. Besides cardboard, you could use newspaper. We recommend at least six sheets thick and you wet it as you go. And, you know, keep in mind, if you're doing this on a windy day, this will blow up. So have your hose ready, have your soil or compost ready to go on top of it. But this is a great way to kill off your existing turf or vegetation without having to spray an herbicide or remove it by hand. Reinforcing uh, wooden beds, always use uh, galvanized hardware, galvanized uh, screws, brackets. Either you could go with like a two by four in the corner to reinforce it, or even a four by four would work too, or these corner L brackets. Typically you're going to have pre-drilled holes in these uh, metal corner brackets, but if you don't, you'd want to use something like these self-tapping screws and more of an impact uh, drill so you can make it through through metal to wood. And so here on the um, right hand top picture, we you know we just use some scrap wood and we pieced it together with uh, just some smaller um, pieces of wood so we didn't have quite eight feet. Well we just pieced these together. If you look in the center of those beds you'll see kind of these pieced together wood on the left hand side and one up towards the front of the bed on the right hand side. So that's one way to, 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 re, to utilize reclaim wood. And if you're going to stack these wood planks, you know, rather than um, post and you're using boards, I would recommend nothing thinner than one inch. So you look at two buys, two inch buys, because if you're stacking one inch thick boards, they tend to um, bow out or it just takes more reinforcement on the inside. So think about two inch thick boards if you're looking to stack multiple layers. So this is an example of using, you know, more of the cedar post or any type of post type wood. So it could be four by four inches, six by six inches. Here on the right hand, upper right hand side, those are six by six um, inch pieces of cedar posts. So that takes um, more reinforcement as far as boring uh, bits that are pictured there, the two metal boring bits. Um, and then we either put it together with uh, seven, eight inch galvanized spikes or rebar. Square foot gardening is always an option with race bed. This was coined by Mal Bartholomew. This is his method. It um, yields um, it uh, requires higher fertility, but you'll have higher yields. You're looking at using a variety of compost types. Uh, and like most raised beds, intensely planting. Uh, and this will tend to uh, shade out any weeds. So just some diagrams of the square foot gardening method uh, you could plant up to. I know he has a revised book. I, I always use the, the first edition, but there's a second edition out of the square foot gardening book. And I believe he went, you know, from 16 carrots to nine. And I, I did note that my carrots were um, a little morphed, didn't grow as, as quite straight. I think it was almost too tight with, with 16 per square foot. So I went down to nine this year and, and I'm, and, you know, I can't tell the results just yet, but if you're interested in, in hearing about that, you could, you could always contact me. But he has a whole diagram system where, you know, it tells you how much, how much you could plant per square foot. Uh, and that book is a good read. Typically, when I follow his mix, um, it's about 20% topsoil, and it'll have two types of uh, compost, 20% each, then 20% peat, or the core is another option, then 10% each of vermiculite and perlite. 
Uh, just think about, you know, when you're growing vegetables, think about our growing seasons here in Illinois. We could really utilize uh, spring and fall for our uh, cool season crops. And then of course, summer for our warm loving crops. And I find it's just as important to time your planting as it is to harvest. I don't know if any of you ever let your arugula go, but it almost becomes hairy and is inedible. Uh, same with a lot of crops. I mean, bigger is not always better. You're going to get the most tender, flavorful things if you're harvesting them right on time uh, at their maturity, their peak. So when you think about um, some of the early crops you could put in here is a list of very hardy crops. Uh, so you're looking at early April, depending on uh, where you're at in the state. You know, really uh, go by your frost-free date, and you could plant these four to six weeks prior to your frost-free date. Here with uh, frost tolerant, um, these are about uh, two to three weeks before your frost-free date, you could get these in. So again, these are kind of more uh, dates that coincide with the Cook County region, but if you're, um, you know, just always consider how many weeks before your frost-free date. It really depends on your, your soil temperatures, not your, not your air temperatures. So you're looking at 41 degrees soil temps where these, these crops do well. Your tender crops, you know, our frost free date is May 15th. You know, always determine your planting days by your average frost free date. Um, so this, these crops could go in, you know, on or around that date. And you're looking at soil temperatures around 59 degrees. There is a uh, uh, spinach that tolerates hot weather. So I just want to know that New Zealand spinach, it's actually not a spinach at all, but um, it does taste and, and somewhat look like a, a spinach. It grows more like a vine. So your heat lovers, you're looking at a week or two weeks after your frost free date, um, uh, your cucumbers, your peppers, and we're looking at uh, about 60, 68 degrees uh, soil temp. And I just pictured here a, a clever way of, um, if you're growing vertically with your vining crops, a way to um, hold your larger fruits like your uh, watermelon so that they don't rip off the vine. So a bucket's one way, or even uh, a pantyhose um, I've used before. And that will swell, you know, that will expand. So common methods for printing. I did see a question come in at what uh, depth are soil temperatures measured. Um, as long as I'm here, I'll just cover that now. You know, it depends on what you're growing, but typically, you know, four to six inches. As long as you have, uh, you know, I would say whatever thermometer you have to use, utilize it. I've used a meat thermometer, but you could get soil probes to go much deeper. But I would say go four to four to six inch deep to measure soil temps. For um, you know, common methods of planting. A lot of, you know, you want to, again, with vegetables, you want to get more bang for your buck. And uh, some of these crops are just um, more cost efficient to direct seed. So the list on the left, I would um, direct seed most of those, typically your root crops, your leafy greens, um, and then, a, you know, a number of the squash and cucurbit, the cucurbit family. So your melon, squash, cucumber, as far as transplants, you know, broccoli could really go either way. You could direct seed that, but I, you know, if I'm at late in the game, I'm going to transplant it. Um, same with uh, cauliflower and then, of course, tomatoes and peppers, some of the more popular uh, vegetables, definitely by transplant versus direct seeding. Uh, as far as seed depth, this really should say uh, plant depth twice the distance of the um, largest diameter of the seed. So seeds not, aren't always perfectly round. So keep that in mind. And um, another rule of thumb is really two to two to I'm sorry three to four times their thickness underground. So just uh, never plant them too shallow, too deep. If the seeds are so fine uh, when you plant them, uh, plant them just lightly cover them with with a light layer of soil. It will help to uh, water your plants before you plant them and after you plant them to help them uh, to prevent shock and uh, help the roots settle in. You do not want to bury the crown of your plant because that is, will lead more to rot. Um, 
but with tomatoes and peppers, oftentimes we do plant them extra deep um, just because they can have advantageous root growth and, and will not rot. So if you have leggy tomatoes, certainly um, you could remove the spindly lower leaves and, and plant those extra deep or at an angle and they will grow straight to the light. If you're thinking about season extension, here's just a couple options of these mini hoop houses. This was um, designed by Zach Grant, uh, one of the local foods educators that works works in my area. And this uh, this is actually on a hinge where they could just lift it off. And um, and sometimes he puts, you know, so if it's too hot, he just leans this and, and lifts it off. It's on a hinge. And also he's uh, found a mechanism. It's a venting mechanism that is manual. It just will no no power needed no electric need it just has a a wax ring that swells in the heat and will allow air and it will the vent will open if it, the temperatures are too extreme to help vent this type of hoop house system so again for more advanced gardeners if you're looking to grow through through the winter months uh kale and spinach are usually good options to start with to, to experiment with season extending and growing through the winter Always think about hand, you know, watering. Drip line soaker hoses are, are nice um, because they will keep water off the leaves. But again, I mentioned this before, um, if you're watering water uh, less frequently, more deeply, you wanna encourage uh, those roots to reach deep. Typically we're saying about one, at least one inch of water per week. Um, and that's if, if it doesn't rain. And just note that these raised beds and containers will dry out faster. They're more exposed to the elements. They're raised. They're not insulated by the ground. So keep that in mind. And here's a, a picture of a type of cistern system. So they just refill this. But note, if you have a clear cistern, you're certainly going to get algae growth in there. Nothing harmful, but it is a bit unsightly. So if you're ever investing in a cistern, I would get a darker color. Think about mulch materials. You could use brown leaves, you could use plastic. A lot of times we're using sterile straw, especially in a vegetable garden. I wouldn't use anything like a hardwood mulch just because it's so carbon rich um, and dense and it's hard to turn in and, and break down as, as years go on. Maximizing space. You could certainly, there's a number of designs out there and trellising systems you could come up with um, to help your plants grow vertically to maximize your space. And certainly is needed for your vining crops and things like tomatoes, even peppers. Always consider succession planting. This is uh, definitely helpful for home gardeners. You know, you want to prolong your harvest. You don't want everything coming at once. Whereas on the other hand, community gardens or school gardens might have um, may, may want it coming out once the school year's ending. We want to harvest everything, donate it, or utilize it before the school's over, or we're donating to a pantry garden and they're coming to pick up on this certain date. So, so maybe you want to have the bulk of your harvest at once, but if not, and for your typical home gardeners, you could um, plant in seven to 14 day intervals. Again, this is throughout the season from spring um, all the way till fall. Also just planting um, faster growing crops in with uh, longer um, maturing crops. So planting lettuce with uh, tomatoes or planting um, onion sets for green onions. You may plant those um, extra close, but then leave ever, every other one or every few um, onion set for, for dry onions. Or again, just planting these every two weeks or in seven to 14 day interviews really extends the harvest. This is from one of your handouts. Um, for those of you tuning in, you should have my PowerPoint handout along with um, three other handouts. So this, this is a great one that I always my go to for succession planting. So when to plant, when to harvest. And so that's for um, a variety of crops. If you did not, weren't able to print any of the handouts or, or did not get them, please feel free to contact me and I could get those to you. Whether it be, I'm happy to mail them to you if you don't have a printer or I could um, send them electronically.
Uh, this year I'm, I'm testing, I'm doing a lot of uh, experimentation with row covers. So we're trying to control insect management, particularly the cabbage worm. Uh, so we're using a lot of these row covers. And again, um, exclusion is a key with insect management. You know, keep, you know, try to avoid insecticides and spraying because you will be um, killing off beneficial insects as well. So um, all we, you know, what we do is plant and put these row covers on immediately to avoid that cabbage worm and then just monitor monitor what's going on under there perhaps you have a trapped insect that's causing more detriment so keep that in mind there are um, some organic choices for insecticides but again even if they are organic they could still harm beneficial insects if your plant you know when with growing vegetables you always want to consider flowers as well because they will attract beneficial pollinators also feed natural enemies and what I mean by natural enemies these are things like lady beetles that will come and eat um, aphids so after they're done eating aphids you do like to provide um, food choices as far as flowers so sunflowers cosmos anything in the mustard family serve well to to feed natural enemies and a common uh, myth that I like to always point out is marigolds actually tr attract spider mites. So keep that keep that in mind. I know the French marigold deters uh, root nematodes, but some will attract spider mites. So normally I'm putting this to far far away from my vegetable crop. When you think about insects, um, the majority of them are beneficial, so they do not damage plants. Um, they might be parasitic in that they are um, attacking other other um, nuisance or uh, pest type insects. You could purchase and release these, but I always say, you know, why not just plant what they like to eat and they will come naturally. Uh, so again, to maintain that population, make sure you're planting what they like to eat. Um, also, you know, things that they do like wild carrot, dill, tansy will attract beneficials, I know still could get out of hand, but um, it's something to consider. When you're looking to control diseases, we always recommend using disease-resistant varieties. So that might limit you a bit with your, your heirlooms, but um, you know, hybrids are nice in that they, they do offer more disease resistance. And uh, always clean up your garden at the end of the season. So any you know leftover plant material could really be a vector um, for harboring insect pests and disease. Choosing the proper site, so again, full sun, close to water, something convenient. Keeping, you know, monitoring your garden to make sure plants are growing vigorously and providing them with enough, enough nutrients and water. It's really hard to follow crop rotation in a raised bed garden, but you could do the best you can if you have multiple beds or an extra long bed. It's a bit easier, but you really need to follow crop rotation um, as far as the as families go. So you would have to rotate whole entire families. So that would be um, tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, eggplant are all in the nightshade family. You would have to rotate those out on a three to five year cycle. Um, so if all you're growing is tomatoes and peppers, that's really um, impossible to do. So just try to exclude insects and keep your plants vigorous and, and hopefully avoid that situation altogether. And always know what you're dealing with, whether it's a disease, fungus, bacteria, uh, insect, so you could use a, a appropriate fungicide or insecticide if that's your choice. Um, I did mention this a bit earlier, so here's the um, other list of family groups. Three year cycle if possible, I've read um, five years is doable. So these are the groupings of crops. And how I follow this is I really come up with a plan. So on the right hand side, you'll see a, an image there, a diagram of how to, um, to plan properly and um, try to rotate your crops as best as possible. Also keep in mind to put your, locate your taller, tallest crops on the north end of your raised beds. You do not want them on the south side shading out the rest of your garden. So taller crops should be located on the north end of any type of raised bed or garden. For fall and winter preparation, you may choose to um, put some 
landscape fabric over there. This is a more porous landscape fabric where it has holes. It's going to allow the, the plants to breathe. Sometimes I get out there in um, early March to put this on just to keep weed seeds from germinating. You could put it on uh, in the winter. There is some controversy on whether or not um, that's good for the soil as far as suffocation. But as long as there's some holes in there, I feel um, you should be okay. You could also add manure, fresh manure at this time in fall. You're looking at putting manure on at least 90 to 120 days before harvest. That depends on what you're growing. So some tips to remember, um, prepare the soil well. Always use a good quality soil to begin with or soilless mix. Then you could amend as needed. At least um, most of these crops are annual, so it's easy to get in the soil and to amend as needed. Choosing those disease resistant plants. And again, harvesting and planting at the proper time. As far as uh, watering goes, can't stress this enough, water deeply, deeply less frequently. So about one inch a week on average. Mulches should be about three to four inches deep. Uh, good sanitation. So cleaning your tools, um, if it's you know if it's appropriate to cut to harvest, do so. If it's appropriate to to pick off with your hand, um, do it that way. And of course, you're putting in a lot of hard work, so enjoy your harvest most of all. There's plenty of helpful websites out there. I particularly love our Watch Your Garden Grow from U of I Extension. It has a vegetable directory that's useful and um, common problems, also recipes and um, nutritional value for, for some of these crops. But there's a wealth of other vegetable gardens out there. I like to go to search.extension.org and use that as a search engine rather than just um, using Yahoo, Bing, or Google to, to research terms. Here is my contact information. So I will leave this on for a bit and just remind you that we do have um, other Four Seasons webinar series coming up on May 24th and May 26th. Um, Kim Elson will cover Backyard Greenhouse Basics and then we'll start up again in summer. Um, and here's my contact information. I'll come back to that. But at this time, I'd just like to pause and um, ask questions. Again, all of these are recorded, and here's the website to go back um, to listen to the recordings. And questions. So I see one question came in. If you clean pots with the mild bleach solution, can you plant in the same type of plant in that pot the following season? Sure. I mean, are you referring to um, crop rotation or just trying to kill off disease or an insect problem? Mm -hmm. Well, either way, uh, I think that should work just fine. Again, when you're using this mild bleach solution, so about 10% bleach to your water, allow those to dry out completely. And, and that is a, especially important when you are um, reusing those containers for seed starting. And you could feel free to chime in if you want to speak and ask questions or go ahead and type questions in the chat box. So that, yeah, mainly for tomatoes, that, that would be fine. Again, just um, just keep in mind to, to let them dry out and clean it with the mild bleach solution. Uh, another question that came in, is there any problem to be aware of regarding leaching from concrete blocks? As far as I know, no, but I could certainly um, research that further and get back to you. I see this is a person I know asking the question. So no concrete, as far as I know, I don't see see any leaching problems with that. Uh, another person asked, where do you get perlite or vermiculite? Usually at uh, your garden centers. You could, of course, get it online. I have seen it in the, the bigger box stores, uh, like your Menards, Home Depot, Lowe's, any one of those. What fertilizer is best for raised beds and how often to apply? Well, it just depends on your choice. I would use a all-purpose general fertilizer, a complete fertilizer. So it should contain, you know, the, the three numbers you're looking for, N, P, and K. So something that has a, a percentage of N, P, and K. If you're going with organic, I would recommend looking at numbers close to a 555 
again, I don't think you're going to find just a, a regular 555. It might be like four, six, seven or something like that. Or of course you could use a combination of, you know, blood meal, bone meal, um, potash to, to make it a complete fertilizer. So just read the labels and look for something with NP and K or um, separate products that are going to supply your NP and K. If you're looking at synthetic, um, your general purpose fertilizers are going to be more something like a 10, 10, 10. Okay, another question. Could you please elaborate on what you meant by compost A and compost B? So with um, that was uh, the slide in reference to the soil, Mel Bartholomew soil blend. So uh, what it, you could use a, a worm compost. So it's just two different types of compost he likes to use, whether it be mushroom composted cow manure um, or worm composting. And I do like to vary my compost from year to year. I will use, you know, put on raw manure in the fall every so often. Then I will use mushroom compost one year and then leaf compost the next year or composted cow manure the, the year. So I, I like to change it up with a variety of compost. Okay, another question. How much calcium should you add when planting tomatoes? Well, it really depends. Are you looking at a container size um, or a raised bed? If it's in containers, I would say about two cups, um, two cups per two tomatoes, or if you just have one tomato, that should be fine. But it would help me to know the, the size of your raised bed or, or your, or your um, container garden. And with, um, with calcium, that's really helpful for the nightshade family, again, especially tomatoes and peppers uh, to prevent blossom and rot. So that is uh, an additional kind of uh, more of a, a trace trace nutrient that that particular crops need and it's especially good for tomatoes and peppers. And again, if you have uh, questions, you know, if you want to go into specifics on a certain crop, I always recommend going to our vegetable garden directly to watch your garden grow because you can look up specifics for each crop type and it will give you exactly what you need, critical watering periods, common problems. So most of you, I'm sure, have the internet at your fingertips and, and I highly recommend the Watch Your Garden Grow website. Uh, the next question that just came in was, how do I select good quality commercial compost? Well. If they're a compost vendor, they should certainly have some documents backing it up. So all this compost should be tested by vendors. So I would look for their uh, paperwork and um, see see what they um, what they have to show you. Typically, if you you know some some compost types are going to be you know just sifted or filtered through wood chips. You know it might be a a wood chip based compost, and that may be good for your landscape plants. For, you know, and that could be running from 20 maybe $30 at most a yard. And then if you get into the higher end compost, like $50 a cubic yard, that should be a nice quality organic um, composted cow manure, most likely. So there, there is a range out there, and, and I would just um, talk to the vendor about um, getting paperwork on that. Here's another one. Is it true that crushed eggshells that have been in the freezer for a bit are a good source of calcium to plant in in the home with tomato transplants. Sure, cut, um, crushed eggshells are going to be a source of calcium. Definitely, I would put them in the freezer or rinse them well to um, to clean off any um, you know salmonella or remnants of of egg yolk. So you know, I would always crush this, you know, pulverize those as best you can and add them, and it will add add some calcium. I mean, it might not be the amount you want. I mean, if you're having a calcium deficiency, though, you'll probably want to go to a nice powder form that you could um, that you could water in well and it'll be more readily available to the plant. I'm going to put my contact information up here again. Did you notice if I missed any questions or any uh, last minute questions now? 
is it okay to plant marigolds by herbs? You know, I, I would say offhand, yeah, I think I think you'll be okay. I don't know that herbs have uh, as many problems, you know, are susceptible as many problems as vegetables. I think I have had spider mites maybe on my basil one. So you do want to be, be careful. Um, so I would just say uh, use caution or, or plant them a little bit further away. And again, there's so many other flower choices that might be better. I'm not seeing any other questions coming at this time. Kari or Martha, do you have anything to add? And I just want to thank you both along with Candace Miller for running these great programs and helping my uh, not so tech savvy self <laughs> deliver this program.